Um, so, central questions of philosophy, pretty heavy duty, big subject for the <laughs> Saturday morning after the week before. Um, but maybe we could start with the works from which the show's title derives, and um, Men with Dogs, Men Without Dogs, Dogs Without Men, and AJR, and how that work began to evolve, because it comes from two different book covers for the same publication. Yeah. I <sighs> I ran across it on, actually somebody had tweeted the, the, uh, the image of, of Air with, with the dog, uh, the penguin uh, book cover. And I, I kind of thought it was an interesting cover. And Air, just, I just remember reading Air from back in the day in the 70s. Um, of course, I read Language, Truth, and Logic, I guess his most famous work. But I was just kind of, in, I'm just, it, it struck me as kind of a curious Portrait, you know, and then and then I and then I looked a little deeper and found the image of the other cover without the dog. And obviously, I don't really know the story of the photo session, but uh, it just kind of intrigued me. This kind of this idea of this relationship to animals, the idea, idea of putting maybe the dog kind of humanizing uh, the portrait sitter, uh, various things like that. I kind of became obsessed with try to, trying to reconstruct it as exactly as possible, which is a bit of a challenge, finding the chair, finding the right upholstery for the chair, finding, creating the proper backdrop. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I realized that as a, I hadn't dub, I mean, I guess I'd done, no, I hadn't really done other double portraits before. Um, I was interested in working with, with an animal because I hadn't really done that since I made a, a film called How I Became a Rambling Man, where I was riding a horse. But, um, so yeah, that, those, those, those kind of impulses informed it. But um, it was kind of about doing a double portrait as well. Yeah. yeah, and maybe a triple with you in as well. What? And a triple with you in as well. Yeah, well, the do and then I, obviously I, I, I thought I'll shoot the other permutations, no do a dog, no do uh, empty chair, whatever. Uh, yeah. So I made that as a kind of a satellite work, which is at the entrance of the exhibition. Yeah. And then the animal theme kind of runs a little bit through the show. There's the cat and the Carol King. Yeah, well, there's in the cat, you know, the, uh, her, her cat, which was called Callimachus, um, figures in this album cover for this piece that I, I did uh, called Black Tapestry. And then there's a, the dog figures, the dog with Robinson Crusoe figures yeah. in the video. And then I included, kind of, com kind of completed this uh, uh, other piece I did called uh, Messonnier with my thumbprint, which yeah. is a has a Napoleonic officer with a horse, and there's a it's an engra uh, a steel engraving, and I just replace some of the lines with with my th of the horse's hindquarters with my thumb. And do you have pets yourself? Uh, not really. I mean, yeah. I have friends who have pets. I'm curious about the relationship to how you see the animals working in the portraits, in particular. You see it as a humanizing. Well, I mean, I guess that's the traditional use of, yeah. you know, in portraiture of Addy, but what I thought in terms of the, this idea of philosophy, the in, interest in animal behavior, animal consciousness is kind of current, and I thought it was interesting to kind of address it in terms of the title of the yeah. show as well. And with the title of the show, were there particular questions you had in mind of philosophy or of art even? No, I just, it was slightly ironic, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it certainly generates a lot between, particularly being in this space with the two Rodneys, um, and with the idea of the reconstructed photograph, and then artworks relating to that photograph around here, sort of, um, to relationships of truth and reality and how we perceive reality um, seems to be something that's really thrown up in the show, and how we read people through objects and read kind of extra information, much in the same way as you put so much detail into the works, suddenly everything becomes significant in different ways. I mean, you talked a lot about, earlier on, about the fabric on the chair for AGA being something you had to sort of source. Yeah, well, I guess that one, because I had this, this, this model that I wanted to replicate exactly, that, I, that it became a something that I want to do as precisely as possible. With something like this, it's a little bit more speculative. I, um, in the sense that I, this, this kind of came out of, out of a, again, an image that I found on the internet. I wanted to do a piece about, can I talk, is, yeah, can you talk about this specifically? Because uh, I kind of wanted to do a piece about a, uh, about a gallery, a historical piece showing a gallery. 
and I just started scouring the internet and in my limited library for Im you know, images of historical images of galleries and I couldn't really find anything that interesting. I was looking at kind of alternative spaces in New York in the 60s and various things and I, I kind of stumbled across this um, image of uh, uh, Samuel Coots, uh, somebody that I didn't really know anything about but he was a, he was a de uh, kind of a dealer and uh, uh, art aficionado in the late, who, who in the late 40s Opened the, he was very much a, cha a champion of, of progressive American art and was, was, had written some kind of polemical articles complaining about, this, about, about how, how American, North American art had, had, was lagging behind Europe and had not, or had not moved beyond European models. And uh, so he later became a champion of abstract expressionism and owned a, uh, opened a gallery. Uh, we showed people like um, Motherwell. And, uh, but he did the first show of Picasso post-war Picasso in his gallery on 57th Street in 1947, uh, the first works of, of Picasso from done during the war and post-war. And there was this one photograph of him sitting in the gallery smoking his pipe, looking kind of you know, contemplative, looking at uh, and the kind of, the kind of struck me. So I kind of started thinking about making a piece of, using him as a model, not really about him, but doing the hypo, kind of hypothetical 57th Street uh, Gallery in New York in around 19, I said that in 1949, which is the year of my birth. And um, I, uh, he, judging from other photographs of the, uh, of, of, the, of the gallery that I saw, it, was, it became clear that it was actually a, a converted apartment. And I was kind of interested in that, the relationship is between gallery space, domestic space, yeah. something before the white cube, kind of, you know, something that, uh, also with the, this kind of carpeting, which is kind of ironic that Dan was using carpeting across the way. But anyway, I decided to do that, and an idea of vacuuming kind of came up. Um, I just thought it was kind of an interesting thing, the guy may be working to finish off, you know, complete the, the gallery for the yeah. exhibition to the final touches, whatever. And the pipe kind of, I, I seem to have a lot of works about smoking, which is kind of really <laughs> disturbing to me, but I've smoked pipe in several pieces and cigarettes and many others, but. And uh, I was interested in the formal qualities of the, of the uh, uh, um, vacuum cleaner kind of running across the three panels. And also I'd never made one this big. This was the largest, largest thing I'd make in my studio. Uh, it was the largest set I'd ever had to build. And of course, doing the paintings was part of the fun and the challenge. Yeah. And it's always sort of partly an excuse to do, to do these kind of explore kind of modernist tropes in painting, you know, and to kind of, you know, make the, make the props myself and make them as convincing as possible, almost, you know, as real artworks. Yeah. I mean, it also seems that this work um, does explore some issues of gender and gender stereotypes. So you have the man smoking the pipe doing the housework um, and the woman here looking at the object. Was that something you were thinking about, or that? Yeah, kind of thinking about that. He, he I wanted to have it. I think when you have a, a character of that like that with a pipe in his mouth, he always has this kind of self-satisfied smirk on his face. Yeah. I mean, a pipe just kind of gives you that kind of look of superiority. So I thought it's a little bit like he's kind of having a little bit of a, you know, like look, look at me, I'm vacuuming kind yeah. of thing. You know. Not something I'd normally do, which is what I think a realistic approach to what somebody in 1949 yeah. a guy would be doing, you know, in this position, a gallerist. Um, and the, the the female figure could be like a relative; it could be like a, a a client coming to preview the show or or whatever. But I was conscious of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's something is something delicious about this uh, hygiene obsessed pipe smoker. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's kind of sucking up the dirt out of, out of the carbon, and he's kind of <laughs> putting some more sucking this lungs. poisonous yeah. tobacco into his body at the same time. I did was thinking that was, and he has kind of his his pipe is kind of slightly high tech too. It's kind of an uh, aluminum. Uh, I was trying to get an exact date on that type type of pipe, but I think I think that I mean I know that those aluminum. Yeah, the stemmed pipes did exist in the in the forties, and I think they might have been even made from uh, from airplane parts after the war. For certain, the uh, <coughs> the chairs are. Um, I don't know the. I always thought there may be alto, but 
maybe Scott and Shannon know. Um, I think they were made from uh, parachute material right. from, from the Second World War, so they were like a little bit of post-war austerity, yeah. modernist uh, kind of things. So, yeah. The tri the, making one this big was you know, a challenge to get the perspective right. And, the and I, I really enjoy making the composition of using the, 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 uh, this modular system, this panel system, um, to kind of break up the composition. Th those panels are about as large as I can make, six by eight feet. So the composition has to kind of bring that into, bring, the, yeah. you know, br uh, bring that fact you know, <laughs> to bear. So it was a tricky one to do, to compose for that reason. And this sort of relationship between art objects and domestic space extends next door with the screen door as well. Um, that's a sort of different kind of object from the functional thing it once was, but also touched by a personality um, who's somehow still in that object, even if it's reproduced, and then given extra value by it being silver. Yeah, that's an older piece that we, we did. Um, I made actually just prior to the crash in 2007 <laughs> when people were making, you know, when it, was, it, it seemed like an interesting, ironic work to do. It was based on a screen door, Elvis Presley's, the screen door for, for Grace, the back door to Graceland, Elvis Presley's uh, uh, um, mansion in Memphis. And, and I'd seen it in, a, in a, uh, an auction catalog. It was in Las Vegas about maybe 20 years ago. It was up for auction for, Estimated price of fifteen hundred dollars. The original aluminum screen door, and then Austin told me that last year it went for tw only twenty five hundred bucks. So I could have, I could have had it. But I, I, I based the, I based the, that piece on. Also, is a very typical kind of thing you see in, in in Vancouver. In fact, in the kind of house that is is, um, you see represented in this in the yeah. in the tattooed man on balcony piece. People from Vancouver recognize the architectural types called the Vancouver Special. It's a kind of one to two bedroom bungalow type, uh, modernist type, post-war, uh, actually generally they're made in the 50s and 60s and uh, they, they often had a balcony above the garage with this sort of maybe ornamental, ornamental uh, uh, balcony railing such as the one you see. And uh, actually it was, it was close to suggested putting the two pieces together. I wanted to have the piece in the show, but I, did, I didn't think of it in, in relationship really to that, even though it is, it is something you could see on the yeah. back door of that house. But, um, yeah. And then that light box piece is a, a translation of a poem or something that started out as a poem. It started as a poem, actually again exhibited here in that, that room. It was a piece called To the Tattooist. It came out of a piece called To the Tattooist which was an open letter to a tattoo artist uh, by, from me describing a tattoo that I wanted to have put on my back. And the, t the tattoo was uh, an, Im an image of uh, Popeye, the cartoon character, in a deep sea diving suit with his helmet off and his bubbles coming out of his pipe. And he's battling a giant squid. And the squid is kind of corkscrewing upwards and, and, and emitting black ink which would have been all over my shoulder. So I described this as an all over tattoo. And it was a poem written in the style of, of Stephen Mallarmé, like a, in the style of Coup de Day, with this kind of cascading kind of um, um, text. And uh, I always wanted to do something using all of the characters from, from the Popeye, uh, the so-called Thimble Theater, uh, which is the name of, title of the original comic strip by uh, Sagar. Popeye was actually a minor figure who, in the earliest, uh, uh, comic strips who kind of became popular, became the central figure later. But uh, so I'd always wanted to do something with these, in, with these, this kind of, with these tattoos. And so I finally, having observed many, many guys like, sort of like that on balconies in Vancouver when you're driving around in the sun, summer, the late summer evening or something, just kind of somebody checking out the street scene, I kind of decided to do it like that, yeah. to contextualize it. But do you have tattoos yourself? No, no, I don't, no. Was it a fantasy editor? What? Was it a fantasy editor? <sighs> it was interesting to do, but I mean, I had them, obviously they were just applique tattoos, yeah. and, uh, uh, and I thought of it, but after I had all these, I decided, no, I don't really need any of them. I had them for, for a week or so, <laughs> it was enough. 
Um, and then this sort of theme of translation reappears upstairs with the Robinson Crusoe in the Arabic first edition as well. And, that, and I think that's interesting in your work sometimes where you um, appear to be showing something but conceal it at exactly the same time as you show it. So the book itself is in the silver case. Then the video, you're reading the book that we can't read. Yeah. And we have to trust you that that's the book. Yeah, yeah. In the silver case. That's part of the problem. I'm, one of the reasons that I stopped, I mean, I, I did a lot of book-based works before, but I, I kind of got, and they always ended up being kind of precious objects like that that you didn't have access to, really, yeah. other than in uh, some secondary way through, you know, in this case, the documentation. But I sort of stopped doing works like that for a reason, I guess. For that reason, it was slightly problematic. But this piece actually is something that I originally conceived 20, maybe 25 years ago. I was working very closely with a, with a publisher friend uh, who I still work with, some, sometimes Yves Gebert in, in uh, Belgium. We produced a lot of book editions together and a lot of slip cases uh, for books, <clears throat> which I became kind of interested in doing after I'd done these sort of sculptures where there were kind of bookshelves, like I would do shelves for, for Freud, volumes of Freud, editions of Freud, for example, and in a Judd-like kind of uh, bookshelf that kind of mimic Judd-like progressions as a kind of uh, ironic intervention, I guess. So I was doing a lot of works like that, and amongst those works I, was a piece that I, I made a little drawing that he only reminded me of, again, a few years ago. With, for a, uh, a silver slipcase for, for an edition of Robinson Crusoe with a, with a spring-loaded yeah. uh, uh, feature. And uh, finally he found, you know, 20 years later, he found this edition. They're kind of collaborative works in that yeah. sense. He found this edition that was the first, not only the first uh, Arabic translation of Robinson Crusoe, but apparently the first Arabic translation of any European fiction. So it's from early, from 1810, I think. And... Uh, so then, yeah, that's exhibited on the table. And of course, it was a Sheraton table on an Anatolian carpet of, of the early 20th century. So yeah, for that, that whole upstairs is kind of like a, intended to kind of replicate a kind of bourgeois interior, yeah. you know, some you know, scholar's interior or something. But I think it also resonates with the, some of the books you've put behind the, uh, uh, Portrait. So you have um, a lot of J.L. Austin in there, how right. to do things with words, and, and someone who's really about the philosophy of language and how we communicate. And is that something you're thinking of as it kind of goes from iterations in painting, in uh, photography, in lightbox works, and into other works? Because it seemed um, to be really echoing the sort of Arabic script that you can't read, how to do things with words in the background, yeah, yeah. and the whole kind of magician's performance with the bookcase. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, it's more like in, with, with, the, with, with these works, it's more about the language of modernism, you know, yeah. my interpretation of that or my intervention into that. And upstairs, yeah, it's bit, to me, the whole thing is a, that, that is a bit more reflecting back on a, a form period of my work that was more about yeah. language per se, you know, but uh, now I'm more interested in the language of in the way the language of painting. Yeah. So it re reflects a more current interest, let's say. But also it seems to be a lot about how people construct identities through objects around them, or how we interpret the objects um, around people to say something about their characters, which is a, particularly during a week of art acquisition, um, something that's kind of interesting. So I always imagine the person who buys say a David Shrigley drawing is a sort of humorless person who wants all their friends to think, hey, I'm really into jokes. When right, they're not. right. Um, when they're not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they were genuinely funny, they might not need that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I guess it's about the relationships between identity and the objects we surround ourselves with. I mean, obviously that becomes something I'm hyper-conscious of as I'm working through this show. Like we talked about the pipe and what that might say. Sorry, about. what? We talked about the pipe and what that say, might say about the man. Yeah, yeah. Normally, I ha maybe that's p partly a function of, of this mixing these objects with these light boxes, which I always have a hard time with. 
like I, I have a hard time putting, I, I always find these light box images are, they don't really, they tend not to mix. And I wasn't gonna originally put these paintings in the room. Originally they were gonna go upstairs because I thought it was kind of too much. Like, but there's something about the space too with this, particularly this open angle here and yeah. that, that kind of makes this weird panorama where you just, you can kind of, it, it kind of oddly in the end did work for, did work for me. But normally I shy away from that. I usually like to have a room of, you know, like, yeah. like to even mix a light box up, up with the air light box or the, with these other objects. Sometimes I, I feel like it, it doesn't really work. There's something about the experience of these backlit works that, that kind of is so absorptive, it kind of takes away, but I don't know. I think this sort of works. No, I think this really works. And I think also partly because it um, raises questions about which space is being extended. Um, and between the real and the uh, represented. Right. And you're kind of in this slightly limbo position where is that sort of extending this or is this extending that? Yeah. Um, and I think it has this nice in-between quality. Again, this asserting and denying at the same time. Um. Yeah, I mean, the paintings, I mean, this in a way, really ultimately was just an excuse to, to try to continue to find ways of continuing painting for me because it's something that I'm I'm kind of fascinated with but I, I only kind of came to it later because of my my background just kind of starting out with, with, with kind of photo conceptualism and in that period you know my education kind of I kind of entered into the educational art edu educational system of when that kind of photo con when conceptual art and photo conceptualism was kind of peaking and dominating the discourse and all my teachers like Ian Wallace and Jeff Wall had kind of come out of painting and gone through that. And I, and I sort of, I thought I didn't miss it, but then later I kind of did feel like I, I kind of missed out on that. And so I, and then I, but I realized, and the more I do it, the more I realize painting is something like a calling and something that it takes a lifetime to master. And I, I, I really jumped into it far too late to ever really attain any kind of mastery. So it, it always has to have a kind of, uh, kind of an excuse, you know, to, to kind of, and the light boxes kind of provide that for me in a way. I mean, that's the most fun part of making this work, which is kind of fairly elaborate set, but actually realizing the paintings with people that I work with. Yeah. So what is the attraction to painting for you? I guess it's just, just I guess it's the lure of studio practice in general, yeah. you know, which I kind of, again, earlier I kind of prided myself on not, not really uh, needing, because when I started obviously doing kind of conceptual work and book, and book works, very small, intimate scale works, I could do everything at home and I, I really had no, I never really had a studio for many, many years. And then once I did have the opportunity to have one, this idea of studio practice as a, in the studio space as a performative space, kind of like the possibilities opened up, you know, I guess. Yeah. And then what happens to a lot of the, I mean, I can't help wondering what happens to a lot of these props once you're done with them? Well. Um, do you have like a warehouse somewhere that's been? No, no, no. No, they just, they kind of lie around in the, as I told you, the chair upstairs, yeah. I've taken it home, but, um, no, I don't have a I don't have a proper archive. Sometimes they get they get paint you know the paintings would get painted over and turned into something else. And, yeah. And do you associate those objects with all the other people you've been in the light box works? Sorry. What? Do you associate these objects? So you have the chair from the AJ Air. Does that permanently remind you of being AJ Air? Or is it no, 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 no. It's just, it's just wow! I got a nice chair out of the deal, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> More. <laughs> I let it go. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously upstairs, um, music plays a theme um, in the Carol King um, works. Um, why did you select that album? Well, I had, <clears throat> I had done like um, a series before called Black Square is my top 100, which was 100 record album covers, 12 inch album covers that I painted as kind of, I painted over as monochromes. And uh, so I had done it before, but with one, just kind of thrift store records and random albums that I had that were not particularly valuable or whatever. <clears throat> Partly just it was a way of, kind of, all these albums, especially old ones, they all have different kinds of varnishes and finishes on them, and they take ink in a different way. And it's always fun just to kind of just take in the ink and see what happens when you kind of 
put it over. Sometimes it would kind of not take. There was a certain yeah. resist to the other times it would absorb. And uh, also, so I made that series and then and, and of, of 100. Uh, and they were kind of, they kind of were exhibited, you know, as framed objects, but they came in kind of these sort of rock kind of uh, road cases stacked in these road cases. So it was kind of like uh, a little bit of that kind of illusion. But I wanted, to, I'd wanted to do something with, with this particular album for a long time, partly because it's kind of an arc, iconic album for me. Carol King, of course, was like a, 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 a brill building songwriter, worked with her husband, uh, Jerry Goffin, and wrote kind of many hits can't enumerate them all. The first one that comes to mind is Would You Still Love Me Tomorrow, songs like that, in New York. And then she kind of reinvented herself as a kind of singer-songwriter in that era, in the 70s era, Topanga Canyon, moved to Topanga Canyon and in the era of Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, singer, LA singer-songwriters. And um, she put out this, what was a very iconic album in, seven, in 72, with this covered very, very typical of, of the sort of singer-songwriter genre. She's sitting in the, in the kind of, the, in the bay of a bay, the bay window in her, her Topanga Canyon pad with her, with her cat looking very comfortable. And uh, it was done in the kind of gatefold sleeve with kind of watercolor, fake watercolor paper, kind of, to kind of enhance this kind of, and I'd worked with, with this kind of, surface before, so I was kind of interested in, and I thought, well, let's explore this, but man, many of the subsequent reissues of the album were done on different types of paper. So I just collected as many as I could, yeah. and worked in different colored inks. Uh, the title kind of interested me, I came up with the title Black Tapestry, which kind of gave it a kind of veering into, into kind of a goth or a black metal yeah. kind of aesthetic, which I thought was fun. Yeah. And they're just really fun to do, because, you know, what can I say? But also sort of erasing the image that goes with the album. Um, erasing? It, yeah, I mean, it's all partially erased or covered over. Yeah. Or, you know, it's returned to the idea that, I don't know if the records are in the sleeves. No, I took them out, I have them all, but I, I took them out. But it sort of leaves you with just the idea that inside is something musical and without the kind of interpretive filter that the staged picture um, Yeah, yeah. You. Then earlier in the week, you uh, performed as a musician in Dan's show on the other mm -hmm. side. I wonder if you see performing in, say, one of the Lightbox works and performing as a musician, are those two fundam fundamentally different things? Or do they relate to each other in any way? Or I suppose on a, on a superficial level, they're similar. Obviously, I'm performing, but this is really dead easy. <laughs> like, it's not like I have to emote or do anything. I mean, it's much more difficult to actually perform. And I'm much, it, like I wouldn't really get nervous before I'm doing this photo session per se. I'm yeah. usually fairly prepared, but I get very nervous when I'm actually performing. It's a much different thing. I mean, you can fit, I mean, the thing about performing, which is terrifying, is that you can just, you know, you, know, you, could, you could just all fall apart at any given, any given time. And uh, that's part of the adrenaline rush, I guess, you get from it. But this is kind of a different thing. But I guess, yeah, it's performance. I, I don't really enjoy a musical performance. I mean, I, I kind of enjoy it when I do it, but I don't, I don't like to make a habit of it because I find it very, very stressful and difficult. Because of the audience. Yeah. I'm very nervous. <laughs> I've had some of the worst experiences of my life playing live music, like where, where I was just... It happened to me recently, in fact, where I was playing my guitar and every chord that I knew was coming up that I had to play, I didn't know what it was until I just got there for 40 minutes and it was just like terror, 40 minutes of terror, absolute terror. <laughs> but this is what happens to performers like this. It can happen to anybody. Lawrence Olivier, yeah. in the middle of his career, he developed stage fright. People couldn't, you couldn't, they couldn't look at him in the face, wasn't it? Something yeah. like that. Anyway, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a different thing, although Superficially, I suppose it's the same. But I guess, do you have the same anxieties before an exhibition opens? That maybe everyone will hate it, or maybe I shouldn't have done that? Um, not that I Yeah, I would have that, but nothing compared to a performance. And we're like, nothing, no, I find that much more terrifying. 
Because you, I mean, if the work is done, you know, well, whatever, it's done. But yeah. when you're when you're performing music, it's unfolding in real time, and the possibilities of catastrophe just are, are looming in your mind. You know, the whole not the whole time, but immediately prior to it. <laughs> well, maybe we should um, invite some more catastrophe <laughs> yeah. and um, <laughs> ask for. Has anyone in the audience got questions they want to ask? Or... Tom. Oh, Hold on. Sorry, can we do it with the mic? I'll just go to you next. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Hello. Um, I wondered why you um, are engaging with painting at this particular time. I guess it was like well, during the first years of my career and whatever. They were all kind of. It was. It was all about about Duchamp, you know. And it was like Duchamp versus Picasso, you know, like always in my in my training. It was just, and I kind of chose, and I always thought there was this dichotomy in a way, and like uh, you know Duchamp's famous "stupid as a painter" comment, whatever. Um, and it was only it was kind of like discovering Picasso again, I guess, at a certain point later in life that I was going, "Hey, wait, this is like incredible," you know, kind of thing. And and uh, yeah, I guess it's that. It's just kind of in a way Picasso's kind of response. Well, the first the, the first kind of show that I made of paintings per se, of my own paintings, other than the, actually the first were paintings that I did here. But one of the one of the, I think maybe even before that I did a show called was it was called Picasso, ironically titled Picasso, My Master, because uh, I was kind of like addressing the mastery of Picasso as opposed to that that of Duchamp. So really it was, in a way, just a sudden discovery, you know, eye-opening discovery or something. Hard to say when exactly. I mean, do you think you've become more conscious about a relationship to art history as your career's gone on? Yeah, I suppose that's true, yeah. Um, so I probably know the answer, but does um, chance play any part in your work? And, um, and then the follow-up to that is, say when you're constructing a, a, a work like this, do you ever change your mind um, in terms of how you set the, the photograph while you're setting up the set. For example, could you potentially have had the woman standing over here and the gallerist over here? Or is it already set in place before you shoot the work? Well, I mean, I mean first of all, the, the chance aspect comes in maybe in the, in the kind of aleatory research that, that one would do just on the internet or reading or something like that. So another interesting Quote from Picasso, I, I, I always loved, I do not seek, I find, or whatever, you know, is this idea of not really looking but, but finding, so a little bit of chance. That's kind of a bit of a luxury, you know, I think of being an artist is, is having things kind of come to you. But once I begin to, once I make a set, I generally don't really change it. It's kind of nerve wracking, because, and there, actually, I, I did consider putting uh, putting the, the other room on the other side because in the in the, hit, the original gallery that I kind of modeled it on, it is on the there is a room an opening somewhat like that on the other side. But once I start going on something like that, I I can't really. It's so, especially with something like this, we have to figure out exactly and exactly where the breaks are going to go. All of that you know, uh, all that has to be figured out. So this was made pretty well. We make models first and then. I don't do the photography myself. I work with the photographer. Um, um, so we would, you know, we would tape things out on the studio. And there's actually really no turning back at a certain point. It's just a little bit nerve wracking, but well, there's not exactly going to work out. But um, with smaller sets, yeah, maybe sometimes. But with something like this, no. And even with the set for the for this uh, uh, the balcony piece, it had to be. Figured out to the, those are two smaller panels. Originally, I wanted to make two six-foot panels, but they're two five-foot panels. It didn't really work formally, so we had to kind of rethink it because I did want to make it split. I didn't want to make it. I did want to make a diptych, but again, yeah, no. Once once we're going on the set, there's really no turning back. Uh, Rodney, you mentioned uh, Picasso and Duchamp. Um, Apparently, when Duchamp died, because he'd becoming very popular with Rauschenberg and all these artists following him yeah. and not following so much the painting uh, historical stream, 
And apparently when Duchamp died, Picasso said he was wrong. Um, about three years ago, I, th I think it, and excuse me, but I think it was the Musique Moderne in, in Scandinavia had a show called He Was Wrong, and it juxtaposed the works of Duchamp and Picasso together, showing the oh, really? different streams, yeah. yes. So I just wanted to mention that. Oh, you're, you're sure, thanks for that. He was, he was, who said he was wrong? Picasso. Oh. Picasso, when Duchamp died. Picasso, of course, was a hero for all those years. Oh, right. He said, he's the one who said of Duchamp. Yes. Right. And, of course, I mean, I think of Picasso as an evolution of art right within the artist from the late 1900s right through to the 60s when he died. And then, of course, in the 50s and 60s with all these brilliant artists, conceptual artists starting to follow Duchamp and the ready-made and the found objects, uh, Picasso was a little out of sort that everybody wasn't right. paying homage to him. Right. So it was an interesting show. I have the little catalog I could show you. Oh, that. cool. Beautiful show, comparing them, juxtaposing them. Oh, cool. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. I'm sure you've been asked this a lot before, but um, the relationship between you and Jeff Wall, the light boxes, the, uh, his work's not worthy per se, but yours seems to be a... Your characters don't seem to be worthy in that way. It seems to be what? They don't seem to, his, his work seems to have a certain kind of worthiness to it that, uh -huh. that yours doesn't. I just wanted to ask what the, how you saw your relationship to that, with the light boxes. Well, of course, I mean, I was, you know, I was a student of his, so I kind of got the idea of him and, and other people, but of, of doing light boxes for him. But, I mean, I guess I started using myself as part of a way of differentiating my practice from that of, and, and, uh, and Jeff and, and people like Stan Douglas who take a kind of directorial kind of position. And so I, I always thought, well, using myself as a performer is a way of limiting the subject matter too. I don't know about worldliness, but a way of restricting it. And as I get older, it gets harder and harder because there are less and less roles that I could plausibly play. So you go from the, from the lead lead roles to the character, you know, the normal trajectory of an, of an actor, the character roles, and then after that, whatever. This, <laughs> so yeah, that's, um, but obviously I, I, I relate to, I relate to, to that work as, as, a, as a, you know, something that inspired me. I mean, I was a student of both him and, and Ian Wallace, who actually set up these sort of very similar mise-en-scene that I'm using now. Yeah. And when you're assuming these um, characters, how do you establish the limits of how far you're going to go? You know, you didn't go for the full AJ Air hair. Well, because, partly because I can't with, the images are so sharp, the camera's so sharp, there's no way I could ever wear a wig. Actually, that's another limit, limitation. Yeah. Because you can't, I mean, there's no way, because nowadays with, with, with high def, it's so difficult to, to, you know, you can see, you've seen in movies now where somebody's wearing a wig, it's so obvious, you yeah. know, people know, and, and so I couldn't do that, so I'm limited in how much I can do, you know. We can do a little bit of, I mean, you can't, you can do, you can't do Photoshop, it would be, would be too much work to kind of do every follicle of hair, which, you know, I can do, that one actually has, the air one actually has, I think it's the only one that actually has some Photoshop work on my face to make me look, my complexion look a little more rosy, like Ayers is. <laughs> kind of, he kind of has peaches and cream, and, and a little bit softer. And of course, yeah. So we kind of soften, we, we soften me up for that. But, but that can be done. But like doing, yeah, I couldn't do the hair. I had to grow the hair. I grew the hair out as long as I could yeah. for that, given that I wanted to make the piece. I could have waited another year, you know, and styled it. But... Wigs are out. <laughs> Could I ask a question, just continuing the discussion about performance? When you perform songs, Rodney, either yours or other people's, are you a persona, Rodney Graham, the performer? Or are you just Rodney playing? No, music? no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no persona. I have to. No, I'm not that good. You know, like I just have to do. I just do my. The songs are just my songs. You know, and. Uh, I, I can't do that. I don't have the technique to, to, to do that. I wish. I was, I was going to ask a question about um, painting technique, Rodney, because you've kind of managed to get that era sort of 
spot on in terms of the look of it, but the way that you actually make these paintings is kind of much more complicated or, or more technical, or technological even, than the originals, although they have that kind of texture, the sandy texture and the gesso. Do you want to say a bit about how you construct the actual paintings? Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm glad you asked that, Austin, because uh, the, um, I should say all of these paintings are extrapolated from, from a single uh, Rodchenko uh, gouache or watercolor from 1940 that we picked quite kind of almost, not randomly, but just going, what's a good painting of, the, of that era that we can start with, you know? Uh, and I, so I picked this, this, this gouache, which we sc didn't even scan it. We just took the file to, you know, the, from the internet and kind of cut it up, folded it back on itself. Started one painting like that one with the pink, the pink and green one. It's probably an early one. It's fairly close. I can almost hold up, I have my phone, a picture of the original. Then we would photograph them as we went along make one, photograph it, uh, bring it into Photoshop, combine it with other, you know, other kind of twist it around a little bit. By the time we got to the third one, we're kind of folding them in on one another. And my idea was to kind of, that maybe I could, this could lead to a kind of formal evolution that might actually lead to something completely original, but that's a bit of a dream. It's a, on the horizon, maybe. So that one, all of these ones are you know, fairly close, and they start with that larger one in the on the on, on, in the very left panel. It's already moving into a different direction, but you can kind of see some of the elements. And these ones here were like a further extrapolation, right there. And this, those little little uh, chevron uh, shapes you see there on the left-hand panel, of, those are those are like that's just an art like a digital artifact from. From the from the computer that we kind of kept because I thought it looked kind of like a cubist motif or something, so a few accidents like that along the way, just combining them, and then yeah, just using that using that kind of system of con so I, I I think you can see that you can see this little on this piece here this little the pink shape on the left it looks like a like a kind of a triangle with that little loop that kind of recurs here and anyway you can sort of see the hopefully. And so my idea was that you could, you could kind of see the potential development of the work into something, something else. But um, yeah, yeah. And the sand idea, I guess I got from, from thinking about um, uh, the use of sand in pe with people, people like Dubuffet, I guess, in the, in the 40s and 50s. Picasso used it. Um, uh, I was conscious of, because I know, because these images are so sharp, because the resolution is so sharp, that I was interested in the texture showing up in the photograph, so the sand was partly like a function of that. Plus it's kind of fun, because it can be what, it can be kind of rubbed back and texture created, so. Yeah, it's the first time we've worked with sand, but it was interesting. Uh, Rod Rodney, um, um, we, we touched upon this when, when I first saw the show going up, but, uh, uh, I think it'd be very well, there's something very interesting going on here with the frames because there's a time warp. Um, the frames there are of one could argue of the period. I mean, yeah. you, you you can uh, elaborate on the frames here, oh, but yeah. the, 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 the 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 point I'm making also is that we are we are here and now in the existential present, and you don't use those frames in the present because it's in the past. I mean, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but I think it's, it's, no, but it's, it's, so, it's so intentional and deliberate, it seems to me. Yeah, well, I'm, obs I'm obsessed with frames, and in fact, it's good you mentioned that, because that frame on, on, the, on the, that pink and green painting is, is, a, is a copy of some of the frames I used for the, on the, they were by this guy named Bush or something. I remember I bought, I bought them in a shop in Westbrook Grove in, in, 15 years ago, whenever before, when we were doing the show uh, with the gifted amateur and these kind of abstract paintings, and I used some of those frames. So I was kind of thinking about when we did that here. They kind of quote <laughs> the last show, the show painting show that we did at that time here. And yeah, I'm kind of I, I had all the frames made from scratch, um, 
by the framer that I work with in Vancouver, who's like really good, and they're based on yeah, they're based on some of the, actually some of them are copies of frames that I saw in, in the picture in the photographs of uh, Kutz's uh, gallery. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of obsessed with frames <laughs> to the point where I look uh, yeah, and I was yeah conscious that these are are like kind of kind of tray frames that you'd see in the in the sixties and um, yeah, I did not want to put those kind of those, those retro -y frames on them, although people seem to be using them, again, these kind of ornate gold uh, frames. But, um, yeah, sorry, I don't know whether that answers it, but, yeah, I, 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 couldn't, I definitely couldn't use those kind of frames on that. Even these ones I find too, too bad. I'm, I'm, kind of obsessed, I'm kind of obsessed with frames. I like really art, I like, I like artist frames, like back in the day when everybody would just nail a bit of flooring on the side, you know, like a kind of, Bob's your uncle, and it's done, you know, but. Um, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about um, how the paintings evolved from the Rodchenko, that you mentioned that in some way you were looking to manipulate something that existed in order to find something original, which is kind of perverse in lots of ways, but I wonder what your thoughts are about when you're making work with a need to come up with something new all the time and something original, is that something you're conscious of with all the work, or was it just with this particular? Well, I mean, but, I mean, with this painting process, I'm always hoping that that something that I'll make some kind of breakthrough and then be a painterly breakthrough. Like, I take the you know Morris Lewis is a good example. I did these you know I mean he had did a lot of kind of not particularly interesting painting for a, for a long time, and then all of a sudden he made this with his poor paintings. He made this made this kind of breakthrough. And one's always dreaming of that, you know. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind just gliding out on, on some, some sort of painting system that I discovered and like, you know, not do, you know, because it's super pleasant act activity, but it's, it's hard. I mean, I'm, I look at these just, uh, and I see them, well, they're clearly derivative of something, but I don't know, you know, and, well, I, actually they're derivative of, of a Rodchenko drawing from, from 1940, but also even as they evolve into something else, they look like a certain kind of typical modernist painting, I guess, but I don't know. I, I just hope that the quality gets better, that's all. <laughs> um, I should hold, I, if I could almost hold up a picture, if I can find it, of the original, just if it doesn't take any time. Oh yeah, right here. Sorry, that's the one right there, I mean, people can see it. It's quite different, the palette's completely changed. But you can see the formal vo vo vocabulary yeah. Like I, I'm, I mostly kind of put them on their side and then I started cutting them up. But you can sort of see some of the, there's, there's loopy elements combined with these geometric sort of shapes. That, but uh, actually we had up on the computer when we were working on the earliest ones, we'd have this, we'd have this one up and then we'd, we'd go to some, some um, Picasso from, and then take the palette from Picasso <laughs> and move them on. Like so these, some of these ones have kind of got a, are actually taken from a specific Picasso from about 1930, I think. The palette, I mean. Anyway, that's the model. But I imagine someone who is like much more Buddhist than I was would have a field day right now with um, ideas of eternal returns and of ideas repeating and evolving but still fundamentally having a central theme that was maybe there in 1949, is here in 2018. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that something you're interested in? Not necessarily Buddhism, but this idea of repetition and yeah, well, like repetition and loop. I mean, looping is something that I've all, that I've dealt with, you know, a lot in my yeah. in my video and film work, and it always ends up having that. Yeah, I mean, there's that return implied, obviously. Yeah, yeah. but also your own desire to maybe break free of it in the way you described. I suppose, yeah. There's that impulse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's not frustrating. What? Well, yeah, yeah, can be, can be. Were there more questions? I think maybe we'll wrap it up, guys. I think because everyone's got a busy day. Thank you very much. Um, Nicholas actually suggested that maybe we should have had carpet in here. The acoustics are always terrible in this gallery, but thanks to Kenji for sorting out the... But then if we had the carpet in here, maybe that would have kind of created even more of a strange kind of passage <laughs> yeah. back in time so yeah. maybe next time you come here we'll have the architraves and we'll have transformed the gallery but yeah. out of the past into the present there is still drinks upstairs if anyone wants to come but would you all just take a moment to say thanks to Rodney and Mark for a wonderful conversation <laughs> <laughs>